I'm a police officer in South Jersey. I've been doing this since I was 23. For the most part, it's not as exciting as it's cracked up to be. Not a whole lot happens in my county. Usually the worst calls are disturbance calls or an occasional shoplifting, with something a little more serious sprinkled in there once in a blue moon. I've done just about every possible shift there is. I did my time on the night shift, and there were definitely some weirder calls during the night shift than the day shift. But this one time I was working the night shift, I didn't get any calls. I was just cruising on a quiet road with no street lights and woods on both sides. I saw the reflection of taillights suddenly approaching on the right hand side of the road on the grass. As I got closer, I saw that the driver's side door was open. I started to veer onto the grass as I slowed down, fully planning on getting out to see if the driver needed assistance. I saw someone step out of the car, stand by the door for a second, then started to run into the woods. I radioed the codes for a suspicious person or vehicle, then got out of the car with my flashlight on and my hand on my holster just in case. In this situation, I had to expect the worst. I got to the front door of the car and looked inside, half expecting to see someone else sitting there, but the car seemed empty. There was a seriously foul odor emanating from inside the car though. It smelled like a rotting animal. I called out to the woods asking if anybody's there and needs assistance and I stepped to the tree line waving the flashlight around. I went back to the car to take a closer look inside the passenger side. There were multiple bloodied tissues and paper towels on the floor on the passenger side as well as the rear seats. They were soaked in blood. The entire papers were dark red. At some point while looking inside the car, I heard footsteps inside the woods. I spun around with my flashlight and yelled come out of the woods. I didn't see anyone. Someone was hiding in there, and that was confirmed when I heard a deep voice somewhere beyond the trees and shrubs. I had no idea what the voice said. I responded saying, show yourself, are you hurt? I prepared to unholster my gun as I walked a little closer. I repeated myself, asking, are you hurt? No response. The voice I heard before didn't sound like a person in pain bleeding out. Additionally, why would they run into the woods upon seeing a police car? Something was way off. I went back to the car and requested assistance. I noticed as I investigated the car further that it had no plates, and when I went back inside of the rear, I found something that made me almost puke from shock. There was something heavy wrapped in bloodied paper towel. I unwrapped it with my gloves on to find a severed hand, and it took me a hot second to realize what it was because it was completely dark red soaked in blood. Now this situation went from a 5 to a 10. I radioed that there was a possible murder and needed backup. I now put my cruiser's lights on to help other officers more easily identify my location. When backup arrived, we did a thorough search of the woods, looking for possible blood trails, nothing though. There were not even any blood trails leading from the car, which meant that the hand and blood on the tissues I found may not have been from the person who I saw run into the woods. Eventually, the canine unit had to come and search for the person. Hours upon hours went into this search, well past dawn, turning up nothing. The vehicle was taken into custody. It had been reported stolen by a resident of a nearby town, who said he had no idea who could have stolen his car. Fingerprints had been collected from the steering wheel, and DNA testing had been done on the hand. There was not a single match to anybody in the database. To this day, there was never any progress in finding out who the driver of that car was, and whose severed hand that was. My partner and I are assigned to a unit in the Sheriff's Department that handles tethers, or ankle monitors. One night while looking for someone that absconded the program, we followed her last known location to a somewhat shady area of our county. Not many stops are routine, but this one was unsettling from the beginning. My partner walked to the front door as I held the side of the house, keeping my focus on him and the side of the house. After knocking on the door, we could hear movement from inside. As the door opened, a middle-aged woman slowly peered out of the door and looked directly at me. There was no way she knew where I was standing. I was not in view of any window at the front or side of the house. What was strange was that most people would answer the person at the front door not look at the side of the house first. 
After a moment, she let us in after we asked if she knew who Camille was, who we were searching for. She mumbled something to the effect that she was there. Things went from zero to a hundred immediately as she dropped to her hands and knees and started scooting on the floor yelling for Camille. This lady had some obvious mental issues and we figured this Camille was a caretaker of some kind. We both knew the situation was off but started searching the house. The entire time this woman was yelling for Camille, never once getting back to her feet, just kind of following us on the ground. The time must have been around 8 p.m. and it was dark outside. The inside of the home had one light on. There were no TVs or any electronics of any kind. The house had a strange feeling to it. The layout of this older style home had about four bedrooms and two floors. Every time I left a room, I swear I was in a part of the house I had not just been in. I would enter a hallway and seemingly be in another part of the house, like I entered a dimensional gap or something. The woman would sometimes be right behind me without making a sound. I was starting to question how all of this was possible. At one point, we both entered the upstairs, which looked to be a regular upstairs with bedrooms, or maybe a bathroom at the top of the stairs. As we tried to open the door, initially it would not budge. It appeared that it had been sealed somehow, like it had been painted over and paint had dried in the seams of the door. After putting in a little extra effort, the door opened, revealing an attic, not bedrooms. If you remember paranormal activity when the guy finds a picture of his wife and child in the insulation, that's what it looked like. There was nothing but storage space, insulation, and an older style light bulb with a string hanging from it. The lady was just sitting at the bottom of the stairs watching us, occasionally yelling for Camille. After what seemed like an hour of searching this house over and over again, going into rooms I swear I had just left, we called it and cleared the property. As we drove off, the woman was now standing right in front of the door, staring at us as we left. According to when we called dispatch and when we cleared, we were only there for 20 minutes. It felt like we were there for well over an hour or two. I don't know what was more unsettling, the fact that it was late at night, the lady yelling Camille's name and scooting on her hands and knees, her quietly showing up behind me when I had not heard her move, or the fact that she was standing at the door just staring at us as we left. We have not returned to that house. My family and I lived throughout the middle of Georgia. Not many stories come out of this area, and this one I'm about to share makes us glad of that fact. My cousin, who I'll call Bob, has been a police officer for five years. He went into the force bright-eyed and optimistic, I guess like so many do. It sounds corny, but he genuinely wanted to make a difference and help improve the lives of the people in his community. One day, they got an alert from a house somewhere between Macon and Roberta. To hear Bob tell it, it was a place that people had thought was abandoned for years. Gives you an idea of the state the house was in. Anyway, when they arrived, an older gentleman was sitting on the steps outside the front door with his hand in his pockets. Bob and the other officer approached him and were alarmed to see that the man was crying. Well, not crying really, but sobbing. And he was also muttering something to himself about how awful it is. They tried to question the man, but the guy was completely incoherent. It didn't take but a couple of seconds to figure out that the poor guy was traumatized. As his partner called for another car, Bob drew his gun and decided to enter the house. The smell inside the house was overpoweringly rancid. He told me that the kitchen and living room were a total wreck. It was clear the owners of the house were hoarders. Pots and pans stacked damn near to the ceiling, spoiled food all over the table, takeout containers scattered all over the floor. Disgusting. As procedure dictates, Bob called out to see if anyone would answer. Silence. He told me that even with all his training and experience over those past five years, his heart rate was already building fast. Gun at the ready, he checked out the living room and saw nobody was there either. He made his way down the hall where the smell was getting much worse. Just as it all became too much, he covered his mouth and nose and opened the door to what he suspected was the bedroom. In the bed were two corpses, gray-skinned and covered with flies. Despite his churning stomach, Bob decided to go in for a closer look, a decision he said he's regretted since. One of the corpses was male, the other female. The skin on their faces was already starting to fall off, and the flies were flying in and out of their mouths. 
Some were landing and sitting on their eyeballs. As Bob inspected the female's corpse, he was horrified to find that she was holding an even smaller dead body, an infant. It wasn't until a large cockroach crawled out of the dead infant's mouth that Bob ran outside the house, doubled over, and threw up his lunch all over the steps the man had been sitting on. When the other cars finally arrived, they were able to do a more thorough inspection. The older man that Bob and his partner had met when they first arrived was a former co-worker and friend of the dead man. They'd worked together at a peach packing company. The man hadn't showed up for over a week, and he'd gone to their house to see if he was okay. The poor man had been the first to see that horrible sight in the bedroom. The story that they put together was that the wife and husband had at some point become addicted to opioids. After some kind of operation a year or so before, they had started abusing painkillers together and the addiction grew and grew until they started shooting up and snorting heroin. Their daughter, who wasn't more than a couple years old, had died of neglect. When the husband and wife discovered their baby's corpse, they finally broke completely and decided to end themselves. The coroner found enough heroin in both their bodies to kill them twice over. Bob's still on the force, but he started drinking a little too much after that. He's been going to therapy, and he's since managed to get his drinking under control. But almost every time we talk, he says that he still has nightmares about that poor child's corpse. And in his nightmares, the baby's still crying. I once responded to a call of a possible breaking and entering. A young woman living alone called in fear saying that she came home to find a broken window downstairs but nothing seemed to be stolen and she couldn't find anyone inside. But then when she went upstairs to bed, she thought she could hear footsteps moving around downstairs. Her call disconnected shortly after she said that, and the woman wouldn't pick up to any of the attempted callbacks. I took the call and arrived to the little house. I went to knock on the front door, and after a minute, I gave it another set of knocks and pressed the doorbell. After another minute, I tried one more time, this time banging really loudly and ringing the bell again. When there was no answer this time, I decided to inspect the house. I walked around the house, and I found the busted window. It was a window big enough to crawl through with ease. I stuck my head into the dark house and yelled, it's the police. It was silent. I radioed to dispatch that the house seemed silent. More officers were en route, but I didn't feel right waiting around in case there was someone truly in danger in the house. I radioed that I'm going into the house through the window, and then I climbed through it. I stepped over the shattered glass into the kitchen. I drew my gun and started walking through the kitchen, hearing the glass crunching below my boots. I shouted into the house to make my presence as a police officer known to anyone who was inside. I didn't hear any footsteps, so I went upstairs, as the woman on the phone told dispatch that she heard footsteps downstairs, so that would mean her bedroom was upstairs. I wasn't trying to be too quiet as I went up the stairs, but I also wasn't stomping around. I didn't know what to expect, if someone with a weapon was in the house or if the woman was just alone in bed. I said, ma'am, it's a police officer, are you here? And I heard back a soft female voice from upstairs saying, yes. I followed the voice to one of the bedrooms, where I saw a woman sitting up in her bed under the covers. She looked at me and I asked if she was okay. She said she was fine. I noticed a slight tremble in her voice. I kept the lights to the bedroom off as I looked at her. There was enough natural moonlight in the room that I could examine her facial expression. She looked distressed. I told her I was responding to her phone call and then I asked her why she hung up and didn't pick up the callbacks. She stuttered and said no one is here. I caught on to what was going on. I looked at the closet and made a slight head nod to her. She very slightly shook her head no. I looked down under the bed and pointed, and she shook her head yes. The weight of the pressure of what to do next was a thousand pounds. The best idea I came up with on the spot was telling her, all right, ma'am, I just need you to sign this report form stating that I was here and there was nothing unusual. She said okay and got up from the bed and came over to me. And when she was close enough, I pushed her out of the room and then drew my gun and yelled, come out from under the bed. I was still shook when I saw a dark figure actually slowly coming out from under the bed. I set hands first and drop any weapons. I heard the clank of something drop to the floor, which turned out to be a gun. A middle-aged man in all black clothes stepped out from under the bed with his hands up. I made the arrest on the spot and brought him outside. 
right around the time the other officers were arriving. The woman had hung up the phone on the police when she thought the footsteps were upstairs and she didn't want the intruder to hear the audio from the phone call. This was also why she didn't pick up the phone, because by this point, the intruder entered the room and had her at gunpoint. And since the police were already coming, for whatever reason, instead of fleeing the scene, the intruder threatened to shoot the woman if she made a sound when the police came. After I had rung the bell, he hid under the bed and told her to pretend he wasn't there. I'm glad I was able to catch on to the situation. It could have gone a number of ways if I hadn't.